It's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening um, for the first in a series of lectures in honor of founding director Professor James Turner, reclaiming a legacy of activism and scholarship in African studies. Um, we have posters around which uh, will give you some details, uh, but the next event is uh, February 23rd, Wednesday, that is where it comes from Syracuse. Guns and Letters, the Spirit of Black, Spirit of Black Studies, and the Act of George Jackson's Blood in My Eye. Mm -hmm. And then Thursday, March 10th, Jesus Jackson Justice, African American Women. And uh, March 15th, so much things to see. Of course, you recognize I come from Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, the of Poetry with Christian Campbell and John Murillo. And then John Henry Clark, an invitation of the Black Intellectuals. Leon Bennett, so that we, I mean, you get into one of the masters. Mm. So make sure you have a copy of this or have it on your door or make note of these various events. I want to also point you to the fact that we also have a colloquium series going. We had the first one yesterday, and this is meant to keep conversations in the field uh, alive. So if you're not doing anything, as well at noon on, on the days that I identify, we invite you to also attend these. And also there's a flyer and circulating as well. Anyway, this evening, we play the legacy of activism and scholarship in Africana studies. We welcome you here this evening to engage us in this um, conversation that we have prepared for you. And I want to just give a few introductory remarks. While there has been a long tradition of Africana studies at the institutional level, if we had to work with some of the initial contributors of intellectual work in the field, Du Bois, Anna Julian Cooper, Herskowitz, and Locke, and so on, at the faculty level, what became concrete in its post-1960s incarnation was a student-led decision for, of a demand for knowledge, and since then, programs, departments, centers have become part of the basic fabric of the university's institutional apparatus and curricular offerings but this not without an ongoing struggle for legitimacy. But thereby enters another issue. The 1980s witnessed an ongoing professionalism and commodification of the field following the entrepreneurial Gates model, so that even if this was not Gates' intent, a professoriate often with sometimes little or no commitment uh, to the politics or the history of black studies began to populate these departments. And of course, Gates, you know, actually titled it by saying he's an entrepreneurial scholar, so there's, we have covers and um, identifications of him saying that. So the delinking of activism and scholarship, which marked the beginning moment of black studies, women's studies, has meant often that once new faculty enter the institution, they are met with the specter of not getting tenure and a caution to keep their heads low, finish a book, and stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. This means that literally we lose a whole generation of young scholars and there's no guarantee that after tenure they will suddenly return to intellectual activism. Still, Robin Kelly saw the articulation of the black radical intellectual tradition as conveyed consistently through the work of several scholars and activists, all trying to figure out, quote, the global implications of black revolt and to find a way to usher it in, unquote. And generally, he says, some kind of diasporic sensibility shaped by anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics of the 19th and 20th centuries. He sees this as profoundly shaping black intellectual radical traditions. So indicating that, that some of this has worked, I'm sure some of you last year uh, saw the presentation by Fabio Rojas, in which he provides pretty good data on the movement uh, of black studies programs in the institutions, and actually indicates that the forms of social protest employed by the 60s and 70s generation actually worked. Ironically, what happened in the interim is that we were cautioned away from those very strategies, and instead were encouraged to develop the more intellectual, accommodating approach, which has also worked, but with a different result than was the intended incarnation of these studies. This evening, we are pleased to re-engage this issue as the first of a series of lectures titled Reclaiming a Legacy of Activism and Scholarship in Africana Studies, uh, beginning with this evening's presentation, which features of the founder of the Africana Studies and Research Center, Professor James Turner, who is Professor of African, African and African American Politics and Social Policy at Cornell. He also organized Cornell's Council on African Studies, forming a basis for this university's interdisciplinary African studies. Turner initiated the term Africana Studies, quote unquote, to conceptualize the comprehensive study of the African diaspora and the three primary global black communities, African, North America, and the Caribbean. 
The Africana paradigm is now widely adopted by educational programs as the epistemology for the field of black studies. Thurno was a founding member of TransAfrica, an African-American lobbying organization. During the 1970s, he was a national organizer of the Southern African Liberation Support Committee, which pressed the anti-apartheid campaign in the United States. In 1974, he served as chair of the North American delegation to the Sixth Pan-African Congress, and in 1973, co-chair International Congress of Africans in Ethiopia. As a Schomburg Research Fellow at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Taylor conducted research on the political philosophy of Malcolm X, which served as the basis for his work on the prize many previous series, Eyes on the Prize. The recipient of the Association of Black Sociologists Award of Distinction, and many other awards we know. He has served as president of the African Heritage Studies Association and on the editorial board of several leading black studies journals. Taylor holds a BS from Central Michigan University, an MA from Northwestern University, a certificate in African Studies from Northwestern, Afri Northwestern African Studies, and a PhD from the Union Graduate School in Cincinnati. Dr. Charlie Ball is the father of two brilliant and adorable daughters, Maisie, five, and Molly, three, and the fortunate husband, Bobby. <laughs> The fortunate husband of Elizabeth Ball. <laughs> after that, he's an, after that, he's an assistant professor of communication studies at Morgan State University, where his research interests include the interaction between colonialism, mass media, theory, and history, as well as the development of alternative underground journalism and cultural expression as mechanisms of social movements and political organization. Paul is a columnist with and produces a weekly radio column for BlackAgendaReport.com. He is producer and host of the Legacy Edition of We Ourselves, which is Fridays 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in Washington, D.C., WPFW 89.3, FM Pacifica Radio, and is also the founder and producer of Free Mix Radio, the original mixtape radio show, and the emancipatory journalistic political mixtape. His former editor and current peer review, review of four, the first academic journal dedicated to hip hop, the global journal of hip hop culture, from Words, Beats, and Life Incorporated, and has been a board member of the International Association for Hip Hop Education and has served as a communications fellow for the Green Institute. Ball is also the author of the forthcoming book. I mix what I like, a mixtape manifesto. And I'm proud that he is a graduate of this yes. center. We need to give him a <laughs> He can be found online at voxunion.com. We need to say that this particular evening's program is going to also be carried on uh, his radio program so that it reaches a larger national audience. So you're part of a really nice historic evening and event and we are really pleased then to begin this conversation with uh, Dr. James Turner and Dr. Jared Ball. Right, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, First of all, especially coming after Dr. Turner's, my bio was too long, and I will amend that immediately after this event. Um, no, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say at the beginning that this is an absolute honor. It's always a pleasure to come back to this center. Uh, the value of this space uh, cannot be measured uh, for people like me and many others. Um, so any opportunity to come back is always welcomed, and uh, I'm deeply honored to, to be participating in this particular event uh, because I know I speak for a lot of people uh, in my generation, those older and younger, uh, who continue to, to uh, uh, try to live up to the influence that Dr. Turner has had on us personally. Uh, so I just want to say that from the outset, and it's, it's, it's an absolute honor. And thank you, Dr. Boyce Davies, for putting, for putting this together. Thanks to Treva and others for helping arrange this, and everybody else at the center, and all of you for coming. So thank you very much. Um, we got a great introduction of you, Dr. Turner, uh, just a moment ago, so I thought maybe we could start with uh, um, some simple biography, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you know, because some, including myself, may not know, you know, you came out of New York City, uh, and while you have done research on, met, and taught the life and work of Malcolm X, you also had some similar shifts 
uh, in moving, shall we say, from the streets to the struggle. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, maybe your political consciousness and how you got into uh, political activism and then the academic arm of, of that liberation struggle. Okay, thanks, Jared. Uh, let me also say thanks to all my colleagues here at the African Studies and Research Center for this series, and especially to Professor Dr. Cowboy Davies and the support also from our director, Professor Robert Harris. Um, I um, came from New York City, born in Brooklyn and raised in Manhattan, uh, from a working class family of eight children, four sisters and three brothers. Uh, my parents were the typical, uh, typical of the people who migrated during World War II and right after, coming from the Carolinas. My mother from the Low Country in South Carolina and my father from North Carolina. Um, they came up uh, just like so many others around the war period uh, and I've often thought if I could just put a pin in it that one of the, the great losses for those of us in our generation we didn't talk to our parents but what's also interesting they didn't talk to us what's amazing is how black people said very little about their experience in the South to their children. Um, when I realized it, I started asking questions of my aunts and my uncles and so forth, but they were quite elderly at that point. Um, but in any event, uh, we grew up in a public housing project after having lived in tenement row houses uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, that's also another story about the urban black experience living in the cold water walk-up flats where you took your Saturday evening bath usually in the kitchen in the big tub which was supposed to be the sink uh, to be ready and clean and proper to meet the Lord on, on Sunday morning. Um, but any event uh, we um, had very little in terms of, it in for maybe what, the first 13, 14 years of our lives as, as what you might call national or racial consciousness. But like many of us in New York and Manhattan, we gravitated uptown a lot. So I would spend a lot of time, particularly on weekends, uh, in Harlem. By the time I was 17, 18, I was, of course, deeply enmeshed in youth black street activity at that time. And we uh, would often go by and see what were the Harlem street corner speakers and stand there. And uh, these guys were extraordinary. They would give lectures on history, on current events, and so forth. And it was there that I met three people who were critical for me. Uh, Louis Mashaw, who ran the, the Memorial Bookstore on 125th Street, where the state office building is currently. And he had this huge banner up in front where he was putting all the new African heads of state. Secondly, was around the corner in a smaller place called the Frederick Douglass Bookstore was Richard B. Moore, uh, who was the proprietor. And I wasn't to learn years later the significance of, of his role in the African Blood Brotherhood and on the margin of the radical wing of the Garvey movement some of which I would often hear them debating about when I went in there. Um, he, I credit, with really starting to engineer my reading in a formal way. He started me out with Du Bois and Douglas and James and John Brown and then later up to uh, uh, 
Massey, Robert Massey and the Dawns of Civilization and others that he would periodically give to me. If I could afford to pay for it, he took payment. If not, he said, take the book and pay me later. And that began to open up an awareness of both history and social uh, events. And then I started to switch to become involved with Richard B. Moore in an organization he had called to tell the truth about the name Negro, its origin and evil uses. <laughs> and Mr. Moore would, would expound on this <laughs> at great length, and he wrote letters to the editor of, of the New York Times uh, to, first of all, capitalize Negro. Just like black, when it's used as a noun, it's treated in American uh, literature and in American you know, writing in, in lowercase b. But he had this organization right next to the Apollo Theater, and so I would go there. Interestingly enough, later on, my mother-in-law became very interested, and she would go with us sometimes on, on, on Sundays. And then last in this was uh, my hearing and being introduced to Malcolm X. <laughs> Uh, it is hard to put into words really that impact, both symbolically and intellectually. Uh, this was an introduction to us as young cats, you know, as we would say. A guy who you looked at and you knew he was no pushover. He was no punk in any sort of way. But he was grounded enough in himself that he was also a strong intellect, you know, what you call, I guess, a grassroots intellect. And we, my first um, introduction to 100 years of lynching by Ginsburg was through him. And he held the book and would lecture. And we'd see him in the evening leaving Harlem with an arm full of newspapers and magazines, so he was always very profoundly prepared. Um, that led to a shift in the guys that I was with, away from the kind of running around we were doing to becoming more seriously engaged. And then later we were to meet people like Larry Neal, and John Henry Clark, who was also a very powerful figure in Harlem, lived up in Strivers Row. And he would invite certain young people to come to his house to meet others. And so this was the school away from school. You know, there was, you mentioned it should be more, and it, that, that quote uh, that seems to, to link very nicely into how you and others, uh, as Dr. Boyce Davy said, were um, uh, uh, sort of part of the foundation of developing what we now call Africana studies. Mm -hmm. So Richard B. Moore said that uh, slaves and dogs are named by their masters, right. free men and women name themselves. Name themselves. Uh, could you talk about how that relates to this term Africana Studies? And then mm -hmm. I want to loop back around and ask you mm -hmm. about more about the movements and impact mm -hmm. of that development. Mm -hmm. But it just seemed mm -hmm. appropriate since you mentioned him to ask that now. Sure. Well, it was actually in that environment with him and with John Henry Clark that we were interest, introduced to looking at the history of the, of the black world in a wider frame. Because even at that time, most of the text by even some of the renowned historians who were then at Howard University always began the history of the Negro with enslavement. And in all due respect, and I, and I say this deeply profoundly with respect, the same was true of John Hope Franklin, up from, from freedom, from slavery to freedom. It has been changed now since Evelyn has done the major rewrite, but that was the customary view. But that in, in the academy, but that was not the view 
of J.A. Rogers, of John Henry Clark, of Richard B. Moore. These were the people I was also reading and met. I met uh, J.A. Rogers in the same way in, in John Henry Clark, Professor John Henry Clark's home. And I remember he was carrying his books in a box. And he went down to NYU, and I remember very vividly, to Loeb Center at NYU, and he was lecturing there one February during Black History Month. And that's where I bought the um, world's greatest men of color from him. But they had this more global perspective. They argued the presence of black people, you know, through all the major regions of, of the world. And so it just uh, made sense to me. But that was also to be expanded by the discourses that were going on when we were in the university. So people like John, John Bracey, uh, Sterling Stuckey was there, uh, Jeff Donaldson was there, Margaret Burroughs was there. This was an extraordinary moment in terms of black intellectuals at Northwestern at that time. Uh, and the discussions in the parlor of someone's home uh, or either oftentimes sitting in the Volkswagen in these debates on our way, you know, from the library home. Those people also held the view of a more global and it was also in response to the debate that Hershkovitz and them were involved with, sometimes with E. Franklin Frazier, around the whole proposition that the Negro had no past or had no history, you see. Uh, I just obviously didn't accept that. So we decided that if we had an ability or an opportunity to structure an academic project, it would cover the full extent <coughs> that black people began somewhere before they were enslaved, and that that beginning was in Africa. Now, we all know the difficulty that black people have had with accepting that reality, given the way we were, have been socialized. And part of my naivete at that time, I thought, if I left home and went off to school and start studying this, I could easily bring it back to the people I grew up with and maybe change some of the internecine conflict that often would go down by giving them a different worldview, teaching them, you know. Uh, as some of you all know how that would, it would go down in these parties and so forth, the, the, the blue light on, someone would step on someone's toe. I said, man, what you step on my toe for, man? Oh, man, I didn't know your toe was in the way. You need to move them old big things on about the way. Mama, who you think you talking to? And then suddenly the chant, take it outside, take it outside. And everybody would roll out. And then, you know, the names would start calling. The, the dozens would come so quickly. So I wondered about that and thought maybe that, you know, part of whatever we did had to impact the reality of the lives of black people. Yeah, there's, um, well, this, this internationalist, pan-Africanist perspective uh, certainly has origins that date back as, as far as, you know, we could go historically. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this wave that emerges outside of the institutions of higher education, so-called. Mm -hmm. uh, just thinking of the American uh, Negro Academy, 
uh, which, is, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. there was an argument over whether that was going to be the American Negro Academy or right. the, the African Academy, and the, right. the term African Negro got debated. Mm -hmm. um, but that had a very pan-Africanist perspective. Sure. And then the, right. the, the historical societies that would come later in the 20th century, uh, or at the end of the 19th, actually, with uh, um, uh, Schomburg Society. Didn't he start that in the end of the 19th century? No, they Schomburg. Schomburg. Where did he come... Just before uh, Woodson's association. Before uh, Woodson. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I, I was even thinking he might have even started that the, the, just at the turn of the century. But anyway, but they had this very internationalist, pan-Africanist perspective in their work that was sort of taking up the slack that was not occurring in official academia uh, or the school system. Uh, that then ended up impacting and then uh, and in turn being impacted by the social movements and the political movements of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk a little bit about those? I mean, there was not only those extra institutional movements mm -hmm. intellectually, mm -hmm. but then there was the, the, the global African liberation struggles, uh, so-called third world struggles, right. uh, the black studies movement, black arts movement, black consciousness movement. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about those sure. how they specifically impacted? Right. Let me also make a quick amend to what I said earlier. Du Bois would obviously have to be exempt from this position that I said that most of these, you know, formal intellect academics took the position largely of the beginning of black people's history. Du Bois is, of course, one of the first in his little book, The Negro. You know, it's really about, and then black folk then and now. And it's, it, it pains me also that Sinclair Drake's major work on black folk here and there in two volumes is, is, is like ignored, even at this point. But he picks up on, uh, uh, and in the book his name, the study is named as, as, as a response to Du Bois is, uh, uh, so of course Du Bois. And he was uh, coming out himself of the American Negro Academy. That's true, yeah, yeah, and, and no doubt. Um, and, and Woodson, Carter Woodson, you know, also begins. But Woodson and Du Bois, I could argue consistency in my point, they were never formally in the academy. And one of the real points now is that Du Bois did not have uh, an academic professorial appointment uh, in, at least anyway, in historically white institutions, uh, with the exception of the sort of research arrangement he had at, at the University of Penn mm -hmm. when he wrote uh, The Philadelphia Negro. Uh, now, of course, he held position, I should say, of course, he held position at Atlanta U. Um, but uh, this point you were raising about, tell me again. Well, I mean, I, I was just thinking, uh, maybe my, probably my own fault, the question wasn't concise, but it was just that there was this, there was this broad movement occurring both politically and intellectually yeah. that happened outside of official academia, sort of as you were just oh, saying, sure. that yeah. built these societies up that mm -hmm. were meant to, to, to uh, supplement what was not being taught in schools or being discussed popularly. Right, right. That, uh, uh, and then I've heard people talk about, you know, people like uh, John Henry Clark coming out of even the, the uh, Harlem History Club oh, and the Blackness right. Society, right. having a direct impact on what would become the black student movement. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of thinking of this in terms of a build up to the point where you become the founding chair here, mm -hmm. uh, that this was sort of the, that that, that is almost um, in part a culmination, though not a completion of this whole movement that was occurring. So I just oh, absolutely. To I'm, the impact I'm reflecting largely on where I was, in, you know, at that time in New York, but I certainly don't mean this to be New York centric. And I wouldn't with Bob sitting in the audience. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I I'm, I'm, know he will comment about similar developments that were in other black, major black communities as well. This notion of history out in the community 
Then you have it related to these large mass movements, for example, like the Moorish Science Temple Movement. They supported this. Later, the Nation of Islam would support it. Um, the, the Pittsburgh Pur Courier, which came to be the closest to the black national newspaper, which was read widely, also carried things like J. Rogers' column on, on black history. And, uh, and so I hope that this as a conversation that some of us and some colleagues, those who grew in other parts of the country will also speak to that. But certainly, you know, what we heard was from other people in our generation who had had similar experiences, certainly with people just like some of the ones that I'm referring to. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about this, if you don't mind, this, this development of these movements that, mm -hmm. that, that had a tremendous impact or would eventually have a greater even impact on the academy itself. But mm -hmm. uh, again, this, this uh, the Black Power Movement, the Black Arts Movement, the Black Consciousness Movement, yeah. Black uh, what we call the Black Studies Movement. Um, could you just say you know a few words about how those movements uh, well, sure, like, emerge, and then how you were impacted. The, the Black Studies Movement emerges directly out of the sort of conjunction of the black consciousness and the black arts and the black power movement. In most instances, uh, there was considerable overlap, you know, with these people. But us as young people at that time were inspired by the discussions that were taking place inside those movements. For example, the black arts movement uh, produced a wide range of independent journals from Soul Book to Liberator to Black Theater to Black Poetry, um, just to name a few, um, that were being put out. There were also all sorts of independent magazines like Maya Angelou and Abby Lincoln and Odetta and several had this black women's cultural organization and they held programs and put out uh, materials. It was interesting uh, uh, how much independent publications were being put out at the community level. Uh, and as you know, it was Maya Angelou's women's group, which was an African women's cultural association, were the ones who led the demonstration at the UN and disrupted U.S. Ambassador Adelaide Stevenson's speech at the UN. Uh, and they uh, disrupted in their protest over the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. And um, so that, uh, you know, there were constantly, there was the AJAZ, the African Jazz Arts Society, which predated the Black Consciousness Movement, you know. And uh, they would have these skits and, and programs that they put on in the community. It would be called Naturally 62, Naturally 63, Naturally 65. Yeah, and then they had a group called the Grandassa Models. Um, and they would put on these mod uh, performances that the community theater, theatrical and fashion shows of black people in natural attire and, uh, and, and natural hair, you know, <laughs> styles and so forth. But I think if I could, Jared, say that what was important and common, because I thought what was common among us is at that point in our youth, First and foremost, most of us were first, first generation college in our family. Not all, but most of us. There were some also who were second in their, their generation. But mostly we lived in neighborhoods that were put us in, that were contiguous to other black people. 
We lived in largely urban, all-black neighborhoods, and therefore we had a similar kind of shared cultural values and social outlook. And we, at that time, had a clearer view of black people as a people and, uh, and our relationship to that community. We were all coming of age in the 1950s and 1960s in our social maturation. And so for us, there was the 54 decision of, Supreme, of Brown versus Board of Education. There was the assassination of Emmett Till, which was defining for me as a young person of 14, 15 years old. The killing of Medgar Edvers, um, later the assassination of Malcolm and Martin, but also the demonstration at the 64 convention by John Carlos and Tommy Smith. You can't imagine how that was absolutely electrifying at the grassroots level, that these two black men had agreed. And there was an, a movement by black athletes that they had agreed if any of them made it to the winner's circle, they were going to raise the issue of the treatment of black people in the US. So the raising of the fist with the black glove was to symbolize what was happening to black people inside the United States. Um, so that there were those kinds of events as well as the anti-colonial struggles taking place in, um, in Africa and the coming of independence of Ghana and of Guinea, the coming of Sekou Toure to the UN meetings, and he would often make a visit to Harlem. Uh, so Alex, Dr. Alex Quezon Saki, who was the ambassador from Ghana to the UN, these things, these experiences were also impacting us at, the, at that time. I would say this also that at the grassroots level as well as among black intellectuals, the struggle against apartheid and the support for ANC and for Mandela was way before the U.S. Com larger, uh, community at large recognized Mandela. Everyone celebrates Mandela as this global statesman's figure. But there was a period when ANC and he were on the terrorist list mm -hmm. and were condemned as terrorist and communist. But they were then... up until just like the last year? Well, he was just <laughs> formally <laughs> taken <laughs> off. <laughs> taken <laughs> off, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned some of the names, it's actually, we, we, you, it, it reminded me of something that, uh, first of all, it reminded me during my thesis defense that I made the mistake of actually saying that, that Richard uh, Wright was part of the Harlem Renaissance and mm -hmm. Dr. Harris, uh, as politely as possible, disabused me of that notion and correct. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, we, we, we were talking to, to uh, this brother, Frank Wilberson, not long ago, who was one of the few black Americans to join the armed wing of the ANC. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talked about uh, in one of his, his presentations was that, uh, and it's something that I think you touched on in the reverse, where you were talking about how people like Nkrumah and Fanon and Cabral uh, uh, and Sekou Touré and others were in, influencing people here. Mm -hmm. He talked about how in the uh, stashes, of, they would have stashes of arms for the, mm -hmm. for the guerrilla warriors, mm -hmm. um, but they would also have stashes of books mm -hmm. in, in that struggle. And he said a lot of them, he said you would be, many people are not even aware to what extent the black American radical theorists were influencing people there. Mm -hmm. So there was this, consciously or not, or, or you know, service level or not, where there was this sort of global discussion within the African community about how we're all going to get out of this mess. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just in the interest of time, if we, you know, if, 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 
that began to impact, again, the movements here, uh, which led to what you and others have described as, the, as this insurgent movement right. of students into the white academy mm -hmm. to bring this sort of politics and desire for this kind of intellectual exchange mm -hmm. into these spaces. Um, right. Could you describe a little bit about that? Because even particularly the way the mythology around and the reality around the Willard Strait takeover uh, involving arms and, and being linked to the Panthers and other, you know, it just seemed it, there was this... Okay. Maybe talk, talk yeah, I, I think um, what's important is that there was two tracks in terms of our education that was going on. One was in the formal classes we were attending, but the second was the debates and conversations and study groups that we had outside. For example, Sekou Toure, uh, Julius Nereri, Franz Fanon, um, uh, Paulo Freire, all these people were being read by us as students and discussed. Harold Cruz, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual was really a major, you know, uh, source of, of, of debate and, and conversation. So that this was going on. The other was also the crossing over national boundaries. For example, Rosie Douglas and Ann Coos were in Canada going to Sir George Williams from, they were from the Caribbean. Uh, from Dominica, at least in terms of Rosie. I'm not sure. You know Ann Cools where she was? It's a question about dates. Yeah, I think some, some of the audience would like some dates specifically attached to some of this. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> um, well, in any event, uh, that this was going on for the most part from 1966 to about 1969, 1970. The first coming of the wave of black students onto these historically white campuses were roughly around 1965, 66, but then it accelerated in 67 and 68. Um, and by 1970 or so, there were then regular classes of people coming. Um, what we discovered was that education was not somehow abstracted from other social institutions or social relations in, in the society, that education itself was a very important source of power related, related to power, had very important relation to power relations itself. And uh, that the production of knowledge w was related to a recreation and, of the societal order as it was, and, and as, as it is in any given moment. And that Educate, black people were treated in educational institutions like they were in all the other major social institutions. Uh, socially subordinate, marginalized, uh, and excluded. And, uh, but also subject to these ideological formulations about who they were and where they came from. For example, the discussion to the extent that it took place in social science classes in the late, middle, late 60s was largely rooted in what C. Wright Mills called this sort of social pathology paradigm. And, you know, I remember teachers talking about the problem with the Negro is they, they lack the capacity for deferred gratification. They are, and I used to shake my head and wonder if any of those guys could live in the home I did when your mother would say on Wednesday, I got $2 to my name. 
and I've got to get to Saturday or Friday till there's your father's paycheck and these children got to be fed. I don't know what they were talking about. The absence of deferred gratification. They would make a great deal of emphasis about black people buying cars. Well, in my neighborhood, the Jewish cats bought these big Cadillacs and, and had them. Italians had them. You know, I, so I didn't know, you know, in what ways was this being a characteristic of black people specifically? But there was this kind of always negative social pathological sort of presentation that black churches were a poor accommodation to the standard Christian church so that black people would be overly demonstrative and so forth. So those were the way in which we were often being introduced to discussions of black people and then we started to challenge that openly in class and uh, and this would lead to broader discussions about our coming in and bringing in information uh, to the to the uh, to counter that it was then that I think black students began to say that we need to have an education that speaks to our truth and to our realities. We need to have an education that addresses the development and, and liberation of black people. And that black people had always held a high value on education as a form of freedom. And so we were concerned about the Carter Woodson's miseducation of the Negro. And I wonder if I might read something right quick, uh, because it relates to somewhat about how we were thinking. Lerone Bennett writes in an IBW pamphlet that was put out that also in caused a great deal of conversation and had considerable influence amongst us at the time. And this is the Institute for the Black World. Institute for the Black World in Atlanta, and this is uh, in 1967, 68 that he puts this out. He said, it is necessary for us to develop new frames of references, which transcends the limits of white concepts. It's necessary for us to develop and maintain a total intellectual offensive against the false universality of white concepts, whether they are expressed by William Styron or Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, by and large, reality has been conceptualized in the terms of narrow points of view of the small minority of white men who live in Europe and North America. We must abandon the partial frames of references of our oppressor and create new concepts which will release our reality, the reality of the overwhelming majority of men and women on the globe. We must say to the white world that there are things in this world that are not dreamt of in your history, in your sociology, and your philosophy. That was, you know what, 40 years ago almost. Well, as we sort of conclude this, this get to the conclusion of this first part, uh, before we open it up for, for discussion, I think it's the, the plan for the second hour, um, I wanted to ask you to maybe just extend that and talk about uh, your coming to the Africana Center. Mm -hmm. um, students here who have risen up uh, in some degree, in, to some degree in response to these movements we've been talking about intellectually and politically around the world, mm -hmm. they sought you out uh, to be the, the initial director of this uh, center, in part because of the work that they knew you were doing in, at Northwestern um, and some of the, the reputation you had developed. Uh, and as Greg Carr said at the, the Smithsonian event, I think last year, that, that you had been given sort of an unofficial uh, interview by students uh, who were uprising at Howard University mm -hmm. uh, when you met them there. And then you wrote shortly after becoming chair here, the director here, uh, uh, Black Studies, a, a Concept and a Plan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if we could talk 
well, just tell us a little bit about that, that coming here, part of coming here. But where does that, because what you just read and, and what you outlined, which is similar to, to Ben in Black Studies, the concept of a plan, seem unfortunately uh, uh, perfectly relevant for today, uh, at least by my view. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that and what that plan was and, and where you see it going. Yeah. Uh, oh, about the plan itself. Well, you have to, you, you tell well, me. Well, let me tell you. So I th was trying to point out at the beginning, it's important to understand that Black Studies emerges from the Black Student Movement. It is, in fact, uh, you know, was was projected and, and, and carried by the Black Student Movement. Mostly black students who were um, in the northern part of the country, but not exclusively. And it was also ref reflective of the interaction and, and influence of the southern based black student movement. Uh, and that in the first five, six decades of the 20th century, we have to realize that there were a wide range of groups led by black students, intellectuals, ministers, young ministers, uh, uh, attorneys, and other professionals, which um, is uh, outlined in um, Winston Grady Willis's book on Against Apartheid, you recall the, the title of it, Bob? Um, it's on the Atlanta. Yeah, it's on Atlanta. It's on the Atlanta. <laughs> right, it's on the Atlanta movement. But in any event, he points out that over this period, there's the growth of these activist intellectuals uh, who are young students, and some are ministers, and some are, are other professionals who begin to focus on opposition to American, to segregation in, in, in the U.S. And this is, of course, also then carried into the university. And uh, the students at Howard were before or the students at San Francisco State. I was somewhat hesitating because I don't want to quite get into that unless we can do in a lab, but much of the historiography of black studies ain't points out that it began at San Francisco State. First in the West Coast it didn't, it began at Merritt College before San Francisco State. But at Howard in 1968, the students had a huge demonstration in which they compelled the boards of trustees to deal with their issues, and an agreement was held that it would be, they would, the, Howard would sponsor a conference to explore what might they be like if they were to be a black university in the sense that these young people were talking. So they put on this conference called Toward a Black University in the fall of 68. I believe it was in October, but I'm not sure. And uh, over 1,200 delegates came from around the country. This is also important because the Yale meeting that had virtually not more than a little over 100 people has a greater reference in the historiography, but the Howard meeting conference had well over a thousand people that went. And black students in the black studies movement were all sending delegations. So I was sent as a delegate from Northwestern but I had also been invited by the organizers to speak at that conference, as was a range of other older, you know, uh, Vince Harding um, and uh, others. Vincent Harding wa was in invited. Um, the Cornell Black students had gotten a group of about a half a dozen 
and they were supported by the university and sent to then scout out the participants to look for people who could be potential candidates for what they were proposing here at Cornell. And I was very struck by them in the way in which they were organized in the discipline. And they divided up different sessions. Some went to listen to Charles Hamilton. Some went to listen to um, the Haki. And they had various people. Some went to listen to Joyce Ladner. And they made a list of the people that they thought might have promise. And then they approached us on the second day and asked if we would be interested if, uh, in being considered. And if we were, would we be willing to meet with them at there at the conference site? And so some of us did, and I guess that was their first vetting process. Yes, then they went back and they took the rest of their list and they discussed it with the people here in the BLF, the Black Liberation Front, and then they comprised the short list that they gave to the, the university officials. And um, later that winter in December, I received the call and asking if I would be interested, my name had been recommended among others. And I said, yeah, I'd be willing to come up and see, you know. And so I came and made a presentation and met with students and met with university officials and some faculty, and then I left. Uh, about two weeks later, uh, I received a call saying that of all the stakeholders and the various constituents, I was number one on the list, and would I consider? I've often thought about that, and friends have asked, why would you go to Ithaca? <laughs> I won't say what my wife often says <laughs> about c coming to Ithaca. <laughs> well, in part, we thought Ithaca was on the way back home. We didn't quite realize it was still five or six <laughs> hours away. But I made an intentional decision at that time, calculated on where I saw what the students had achieved. And I decided, having had the experience at Northwestern in the struggle we were in, and knew most of the other campuses as well, because one thing, those first generation directors, we sort of had a network with each other. People were sharing proposals, uh, uh, coming to meetings, discussing, and the Institute of the Black World emerged as a kind of clearinghouse for that. And so I could have a critical view on what they had achieved. And the fact that they started out arguing for a college of black educational affairs, under which would the, the black studies program would be one arm. The other would be admiss recruitment and admissions of black students. They wanted the, the university to go beyond the traditional places that they went to recruit. And I think this is so important because it's often overlooked. They were already in the university. But they were also committed to talking about how to bring in other people. And it's also important is they argued for the theory of the separation of financial ability from admissions decisions. So it was to be need blind <coughs> admission and need based financial aid. That was a radical position to take in higher education, especially at, at, at Ivy League schools. Because what would happen 
for working class and certainly lower class black kids. University officials would look at their list, look at their family's economic status, say no sense even considering them because they can't afford to pay. And then the students argued that no, they wanted it to be based on need blind admission and that financial aid should be based on need. That also radicalized financial aid policy. And if you look at that, you get then an explosion in the number of black people coming and a change in the demographics so that working class, inner city, black kids could were being, as well as white kids from rural and farm areas who weren't coming to, um, um, to, this, to the place as well. But the strength of their organization and the way in which they were committed to this and were organized and giving support and had extracted agreements from the university that it would be centrally financed by the budget office. There would be a direct reporting relationship to the central um, administration, so it wasn't in soft money, it was hard money, it wasn't, didn't say like some others did, you come in for a couple of years and you have to go out and raise money for fundraising. Uh, they had argued there had to be a facility, they had identified 320 Wade Avenue and said that's where we're going to be after there was some foot dragging so there was facility and they had exacted sufficient amount of money to pay for a startup in the area of five lines that period. Now we're talking about 1969. This was exceptional and so I said if there's any place this can have a chance of happening here is the possibility with the greatest prospect for success. And for those of us who were in this first generation cohort of directors, it was our full commitment to try to build an institution that would reflect on the history and culture of, of black people uh, in the US and in the world. And we were passionately committed to that to bring relevance to our education, to bring greater diversity and an anti-racist position in American higher education. Because the next thing they did was also to demand for more faculty, for more administrators. And if you go around, you said that period from it at, at, at Cornell, from 69, from about 69 to early, late 70s, there were numbers of black people hired as administrative assistants, as secretaries from the community here in Ithaca, black people who had not previously been hired. So it was on the basis of those things, Jared, that I made a decision that if rather than go elsewhere, I mean, there was an offer from, from UC Berkeley, um, and I should also say almost all of your advice by your faculty advisors in graduate school was don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. James, we implore you. Stay here another year. We're going to take care of you. You go out uh, and we're going to bring you back after a year if you take this position in California at Santa Clara and come back and you should stay here. Don't risk your future. I mean, that was overwhelmingly the pressure that was being placed. And so the fact that so many people, you know, Dolores Aldridge, uh, Len Jeffries, Rob, uh, uh, um, Jack Daniels, Nick Nelson, Ron, uh, Ron Walters, who recently passed, on and on. These people were willing to commit themselves to go 
um, to these institutions, knowing that it would be a fight all along the way, but this was their commitment. And they said, if black students are going to go to these places, it's important for us to be present, to share in the direction of their education. And uh, I, you know, I, I, it's hard to reproduce the kind of commitment that most of these people felt. And so they risked it. And for the most part, they were successful. You know, Claudia Mitchell Kernan at UCLA and, and on <laughs> brought about what we now have is this new interdisciplinary discipline. You know, I, I just, uh, well, maybe we should just give this a Q&A uh, at this point. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe to sort of set that off, we can um, throw out a couple of topics that you and I had discussed uh, the other day uh, that could potentially be a good kickoff for discussion with the broader audience. Oh, by all means, let's have it. Please get us well, I have to give a couple of reflections and then a uh, couple of questions. Uh, I'm glad that Professor Turner mentioned uh, what we were doing outside of class as right. opposed to what we got in class. Now, I was privileged enough to go to Roosevelt University mm -hmm. where we had St. Louis Drake, where we had Hollis Lynch, mm -hmm. uh, and August Meyer uh, mm -hmm. taught there. Uh, but it was the conversations that we were having outside of class. Mm -hmm. Have you read Man to Superman? Right, right, right. right. Man to Superman. Right. So right. I got to run, uh -huh. quick, uh -huh. get it, read it, uh -huh. so I could be in the conversation. Right. And if you had not read many of these works, right. you couldn't join the conversation. That's right. You just had to sit on the side, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we... I think learn more outside of class, talking to each other, mm -hmm. than what we learn inside class. Mm -hmm. um, and then the people, you know, who were at Roosevelt, like John Bracy and uh, the poet who's uh, passed on, Carolyn Rogers. Carolyn Rogers. Uh, of course, you didn't mention Hoyt Fuller and no Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, a number of different names, uh, but these were important uh, figures uh, in your conversations outside of class as opposed to in class. The other point that I was thinking about, I'm going to make this very quick. Um, you mentioned that Yale conference mm -hmm. that was very well funded by the Ford Foundation, right. and basically that was hailed as right. the uh, prototype mm -hmm. for black study. That's right. Uh, I was at a meeting of a major historical conference and very prominent uh, historian, I'm not going to, to mention his name here, but uh, he said from the podium in an audience of uh, several hundred people that uh, there was really no future for black studies. Mm -hmm. That black studies was basically all political, as mm -hmm. he saw it. Uh, that the only place that had any potential was Yale. And that was one of the things that really influenced me mm -hmm. to say I would like to affiliate mm -hmm. with a black studies department mm -hmm. and prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done that. Right. Uh, and of all the places at the time I saw, uh, Cornell was the place with the greatest potential. Right. And like you, mm -hmm. I'm in the history department teaching at the University of Illinois, mm -hmm. and people are saying, hmm, why are you going to Cornell? Right. <laughs> why do you want to go to the African Studies Research Center? Mm -hmm. And then when I got here, mm -hmm. Don't you want to join a point in the history mm -hmm. department? Yes. <laughs> you know, why are you just over there? Mm -hmm. I said, why can't you be over there and over here and wherever? I mean, I mm -hmm. shouldn't be limited by anything, basically. Right. But anyway, that, that's, that's another point. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at Yale, the program model, right. as opposed to the department model, and this is something that's held out to us as people are looking at these other institutions, mm -hmm. you know, 
Yale has been running fast trying to catch up with us. Right, right. And another point I think maybe you might go into a little bit, I have two questions. Uh, one is, you know, and, and this is part of the Africana Studies idea, we could do black studies, in a sense, African-American <coughs> studies, but we couldn't touch African studies. Right. And still today, at our home institution at Northwestern, mm -hmm. African that's studies right. is separate mm -hmm. from African-American studies. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, I mean, at Yale, mm -hmm. African studies is separate mm -hmm. from Africa. And, you know, the administration here wants us to look to Yale. Right. Model, right? right. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that the uh, director of the African American Studies program at Yale mm -hmm. had to threaten to resign mm -hmm. for Yale to make that a department. Right. They right. finally did. Right. Okay. Question here. Today. <laughs> I want to share your, your, your reflection uh, with the, the group here as you all went to the administration at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a course on African American literature. What did they tell you? Oh, right, right. I'm glad. I, I guess we're sitting in this meeting with the dean and the head of the English department, and they say to us, You want a course in black literature? How? What are you going to do? What's it going to be based on? Black people don't write. And we said, do you know that Margaret Alexander Walker is a graduate of this very same institution? Do you know that the poet laureate of Illinois is Gwendolyn Brooks? Do you know that um, uh, black boy Richard Wright Major Works was located in Chicago when he was here. We say we take any portion of that and have a course in Northwestern where there's only a quarter, not even a semester. But that was the kind of response. But we immediately were able to prepare and lay out for them what they didn't know. And what we discovered soon, and this is a, the consequence of power relationship and subordination, they didn't have to know what we knew. But we had to know <coughs> what they knew. And if we didn't know what they knew, we'd be disqualified. But they would never be disqualified or censored anyway for what they didn't know. <clears throat> and so what you often were up against is what these people didn't know. I mean, the limits of their education. But it would have perhaps been easy if it was just benign. It was arrogance that was reinforced as well. So that, um, you know, they felt like, well, you can evaluate us. We're the ones who have to evaluate you. But I never forget that meeting. And the, 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 the chair looked at us and he said, is that so? And we said, yeah, well, you just check it out for yourself. And so that had to be in every instance in the African history course. Bracy and I are in this course in, in African history, and they got to Zimbabwe. And then, no, I, I'll tell you this, it's a little funny, but it's important. Each time they got to anything that showed any degree of development, these people would pop up and say, but were they Negroes? <laughs> and then sit back down, but were they Negroes? And one day the teacher said, well, what if they were African? She said, no, but are they Negroes like our Negroes? <laughs> <laughs> well, then John and I got said, since when you got some Negroes, <laughs> you know? But they got to Zimbabwe, 
and at that time the text were talking about the riddle of Zimbabwe because of the stone outlying area and the glass windows and all they argued that they had tried the, the theory that the Phoenicians had come and somehow it stayed there and then some other people had come and all these things were found to be inadequate so rather than accept the reality that it was done by the people who were there they called it the riddle of Zimbabwe but the other point Professor Harris raises quickly is that when the black studies movement now was gaining momentum by 68, 69, 70 and couldn't be resisted, they then made a calculated position. You all can have black studies and we'll have Africa. You see, you all can have African American and of course we resisted that. And we resisted that coming in here, arguing you can't dismember the African experience, the African history, that it was connected. And we were able to reconstruct here. Um, but in many of these places, it became entrenched battles at Wisconsin, at Indiana, at Northwestern, uh, at Syracuse uh, and at Columbia where these guys had become deeply rooted. It led to us having to confront the African Studies Association in Montreal in 1968 at their national convention. Actually it had been the year before and Elliot Skinner, St. Clair Drake, uh, Hollis Lynch, so all these others, some of whom were in the was in ASA, had agreed with us that we would put a petition before them that they needed to admit black scholars into their board of governors. They took a whole year to consider it. When they came back at the Montreal meeting, they told us no. No to the likes of Elliot Skinner. No to the likes of, uh, of, of St. Clair and on, you know. And so at that point, we said, then no to them. And we turned the lights out, unplugged the microphone, and said, this conference is over. And of course, we left that year. <coughs> and started, you know, the African Heritage Studies Association, which went, but that was how entrenched they were in maintaining their own interests. We also challenged them, if you are making your living off Africa, how many of you are willing to make statements of support of the African anti-colonial struggle? That was the other point we raised uh, with them. And uh, they made our, well, we don't make commitments like that. We have to stay neutral. We said when you're dealing with an issue of colonialism like slavery and like apartheid, if Africa is your base for how you are making your career, then we think you have the moral obligation to take a position. Um, and so that was the result of the famous Montreal, uh, Montreal meeting. President, I have so much to say, but I have to say a little. One question I want to use you to answer at the end of it. Clearly it's understandable why the students here wanted you mm -hmm. to have their program. Why do you think that the administration agreed Mm. to you. I was starting I was starting thinking where you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, what did you think in the days for the line for me? Question number one. Answer that for us. I'll come back to that. Well, of course, I could never really know, you know. It's one of those things I wish I could be the fly on the wall. <laughs> I think there was also the fact that when they met me and I came to go through these job talks and other sort of things and tea parties and wine <laughs> things that I was sufficiently now double consciousness, you know, had enough conversance. 
I could handle that as well. I handled that as a strategy. That wasn't who I was. That was outside me, but I knew how to do that. And I knew what it was that, that they expected, you see. Uh, and I think that was part of it. And that they felt, this is a guy who could also talk to our alums and our trustees and so forth. And it was a sort of bit of putting the odd Negro on display. Look at him. You know? He is more articulate than we thought. Now, there are others who said, do you know what you're doing? Do you really know who he is? Uh, so I, I, I mean, that's uh, I could think of because the next year I spent going around to these very kind of events trying to assuage some of the more reactionary responses. And then you said that, let me just follow up on that quickly. Because, you know, I see how much you're influenced by the words. I think you said double consciousness mm. a while ago. Yeah. And although you didn't say talented test, right. you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that you have to go back to the community uh -huh. to educate them on the difference. So I see the voice is instrumental in your But also, right. the can't be like that nationalist factor you get into the truth. Yeah. You know, about the universe, uh -huh. Russians, Jamaican, the whole kind of African thing. So the nuance between the, you know, Du Bois wing and the Garden wing mm -hmm. in your early years, did you, that so-called conflict mean resonate much with you? That's question number one. Question mm -hmm. number two, come back. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I want to sit down. Mm -hmm. When you came to Cornell, you have told me this. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you, by the way. Mm -hmm. This dialogue that we say is extraordinary. We should have more of these. You know, I sit there just for us to read your life stories and whatnot. It's extraordinary what we learn mm -hmm. from if we don't discourse enough. I came to Florida in 1970, government departments in Africa. They recruited me on the phone, brought me here, they wanted a black face, so I mm -hmm. came here, sent it to Center Street, and I resigned, went back to Jamaica, came back in 83, thanks to you. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I, they called me and offered me the job, and I took it, you, you come back to me. That's right. I said, you want to join Africa? Right. I said, you're just about two weeks too late, my father. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for bringing me back here in the industry. Having said that, mm -hmm. you always told me, that you had more difficulty dealing with the academics mm -hmm. at Cornell when you came than the administrators. Right. Now, right now, I don't know which is which. The <laughs> I don't know. But tell us something about that. What was the problem? People in the academy mm -hmm. who you assume right, are larger than these issues, that you had more difficulty with them. Is that true? Yes, that was true. And that was part of the way I also assess the situation here on the ground. At that point, the central um, executive administration was more, quote, progressive than were often the, the faculty. The, the, the white faculty were often the most resistant and wanting also to maintain their own territories. They were, and some of it was also very personalized. They felt that they were going to be moved out of the field of race relations and sociology and replaced by blacks. Um, there were those who felt that uh, there was really no value in African history and therefore it, it had no place and that it challenged them. So yes, they tended, and sometimes it was even so pedantic in one sense, in that they would say, how are they teaching over there? One day I walked into uh, a meeting on curriculum discussion, and I noticed as I came through the door, 
the other guys sitting at the table, white faculty, start covering over some papers on with them. <laughs> so, you know, you get hip to that. You know how to have this seven senses, the boy sense. You look at, so I said, something's going on in that pot. So before I got in and sat down, I said, oh, excuse me, how y'all doing? And I went and sat right next to them. I said, is this the agenda? They said, oh, no, and I turned it over. They had done an analysis of 12 departments in the Arts and Science College and had put them in relationship to grading. Who had given the most A's out? And the assumption was that the Africana Center would have had the highest range of the highest grade because they were not serious, they were just giving out. And it turned out that we came in somewhere like around 10th or something on this list. I said, oh, is this what we're doing? Oh, no, 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 no. They now changed it because other departments you know, I mean, to the extent that this was supposed to reflect whether you were serious about what you were doing. I don't necessarily hold to that, that, you know, you may have a class in which everybody in that class does well. Or, But anyway, that was their thinking, and it was being whispered around. Uh, and so they then start, without us knowing it, had done this two-year review, calculating grades uh, and, uh, and to comparing across departments. And that's the, the, the sort of thing would, would happen, as I say, somewhat, mon you know, picky, but nonetheless, if that had turned out that way, then they would have said, the Africana Center is giving out grades. So that's why I got to be in your class? <laughs> <laughs> you sacrificed me to the altar who got me? <laughs> Brother, it was a political thing. No, you know I would never, I would never do that. But you know what he just reminded me of? He reminded me of this sister, and her last name was James. She lived around in a warrior house. She's now in the diplomatic corps. She was in the secondary level in the U.S. Embassy in D.C. And every time she sees me now, it's 20 years later. 20 or well, I'm being modest, more than 20 now. You gave me a B in your class. And for a long time, she wouldn't speak to me, but... Uh, <laughs> yes, I think Margaret wanted to say that. Um, I want to make a comment, and then I ask my question. My comment is the uh, East Coast, West Coast issue about <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and I, as you know, I'm from the West Coast. Right, right. Uh, And I'm suspecting the San Francisco State University. So. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, about two weeks ago, Danny Glover, who also went to San Francisco State during this time, uh, talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there. He said, I know it because I was there. Yeah, um, no. But at any rate, I wanted to ask a, a question about this department versus program status. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you said was that you thought the administration was, and I agree with you, by the way, about the faculty as a member of the history department. And I remember when I first got here and I said, I oh, you know I've been joined in this department. And they said, well, they're all in that mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, can't we have some too? And some of you may remember that we actually had a meeting with you. Uh, Africana and uh, history faculty about that. Mm. Now it's interesting, we've got three. <laughs> right. Um, but at any rate, in terms of the department versus program issue, mm -hmm. since Africana was the first program slash department on mm. campus, and you say that the uh, administration seemed more receptive than the faculty, mm -hmm. this must have changed at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Because the rest of the underrepresented departments or programs are only programs. Now. Right. So it's as though they seem to be thinking, we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, you've got uh, the other groups that are mm -hmm. 
not departments, but programs, mm -hmm. and of course, having catching hell as a result of it. That's right. So, um, at what point do you think they decided that this was not a good model? Mm -hmm. Do you think it was with the humanities report, mm -hmm. um, which some of us may remember, which mm -hmm. is uh, almost an exact of what they're trying to do now, mm -hmm. um, given what they, they're trying to do with Africana and what mm -hmm. they're trying to do with uh, American Indian program? Mm -hmm. So at what point did the administration, in your opinion, decide that this is not the model, this is too much autonomy mm -hmm. for these groups to have? Mm -hmm. Well, that's also, you know, a very good question and an important one, Margaret. Um, uh, I think there's always been a certain force in the university that has said that you should not have gone to the extent that you did with the students in 69 at Willow Strait, and also then with these black faculty and in Africana. I think it's always, in fact, I know it has. And we've always had to contend with it. I think it comes to a head, really, when Larry Palmer is here. Larry Palmer was a black professor and who was in the law school at that time when there was only one or two faculty, black faculty, and I think maybe there are three now at that time. But they, as they often do, took him as part time into the central administration. And uh, they had another gentleman, a brother by the name of Lyle Carter. But Lyle wouldn't play this game with them. Lyle, even where he may have had some areas of discussion, he had integrity about himself. He didn't let himself be used. Larry was all prepared to do so. And so he started giving counsel to them in the upper reaches of the administration that this is not a good thing. You need to make these black people come out of there. Uh, you need to, black students are following them. And uh, you know, the whole thing, why are the black students all sitting together? <laughs> You know, and my response was, if the black students are all sitting together, who else is all sitting together? Why is it you only have a partial vision on that? But Larry played that role in giving legitimacy to what then later became the Humanities Report because they could say he was black. The other thing is, is that we lost um, a strong black voice in the trustees. Now, um, there was Meredith Gordine, who had gone to Cornell, had been an athletic track star, had gone to Caltech, and had become an engineer of some repute. Uh, I know Mike and I have had some discussions about him, and he was on the board of trustees. But while he was very firmly in the classical integrationist model, and we'd have debates on debates, he would always stand up for our rights to be self-governing and self-determining like everyone else, and he wouldn't use. I think that's part of what helped us get to that point. And we maintain, and I'm going to say this honestly and frankly, whatever our internally, we made a fairly united, solid front in support of the institutional integrity of this place. That, as most people know, yes. Becomes undermined over the last five years or so, and they figure again. Whenever these in these power relationships, if you have 
people who are willing to play uh, and give cover so that they can say, you can't accuse us of doing this to you because of race, because look who's here. Um, and the former, or the most recently, or uh, I don't know whether he's former or what, uh, associate the provost, said to me a year or more ago over a, a meal, breakfast, how did the university ever allow this to happen? This is a black person, a sociologist. I said, and, I'm, and I don't mean our young star, you know, <laughs> Trevor, you know. But um, I said, what makes you think they let it happen? You don't seem to think that black people are actors and agents in their own behalf. But it, it, it was that, in part, Margaret, the ability, they're having others who were willing. And then there are others in your college who were played to do, play that, to play off against Africana for their own aggrandizement, for their own internal power play. Um, so we're, we're dealing with the reality of that. I just want to know that we have about just 10 minutes left. Uh, if we can keep that in mind as we go around. Uh, I'll be very brief then. Uh, can you articulate the connection between the African Center and the other spaces that uh, could be considered at the time as a liberated places where black mm -hmm. people could express themselves? Mm -hmm. And what is happening now with each of them? Well, we've always had a very tight and strong relationship with the development of these other spaces. Wari House first, then Ujima, uh, and we have uh, supported uh, the Latino Studies Program, the Asian American Studies Program, as well as the American Indian Program. Um, they have all aspired to hope at one point they might get to something similar to us. Um, we, given the background that I talked about this afternoon, understood the weaknesses and the pitfalls of a program model and resolutely resisted that. And that had already been done also by the students who had been working here as well. I think um, we have seen what we had all predicted would be the change at Ujima last year. And we were told, oh no, that's not true. We're going to preserve Ujima. Mr. Glover is a valued person for us and so forth. And much of that was smokescreen. Um, they were forced to have to concede another year and waited off another year for things to, they thought, dissipate in terms of the response on students. And uh, they've come back to their objective. Um, and Ujima is a barometer for what is likely to happen to program houses in the next four, three to five years if not sooner than that. Um, just as what's happening to COSEP, the Office of Minority Educational Affairs, is a barometer 
for what's happening to so-called minority students. The changes and erosions in these important policies that I mentioned for financial aid and recruitment. For example, how many students do you know from the heavily black metropolitan populations in, from Cleveland, from Detroit, from Akron, from Philly, from Pittsburgh, you know, even Chicago and Atlanta. I mean, think about how many people do you know from these areas? We, as along with the tradition, the legacy of the student movement here, we in the Afrikaans have fought consistently to maintain that, but uh, others have allowed for it to erode. Not seeing that what is happening in front of you is only a reflection of the larger. And I think sometimes, you know, it is both our blessing and a curse as a people. We tend to be more forgiving, more optimistic, more willing to give the benefit of the doubt when we should know better. But uh, that happens and, you know, these, unfortunately, as we were saying earlier, we tended to think once these things have been done, we're in. We're now a part of the structure. We're here. And they wouldn't dislodge, they couldn't go back on all of that. Well, look at the erosion of black graduate students. Look at the loss of fellowships for black graduate students. Look at most black undergraduate students that get less and less grant and aid and more guaranteed loans. So all these things are changing um, and that's unfortunate. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. And Eric. This could be a little bit of a um, When I first came up to the meeting center, the one thing I admired about the center was the uniqueness of it in terms of faculty that you have up here, like mm -hmm. Congress and Dr. Mm -hmm. Yosef and Yahweh. And I know previously that other professors might think. Could you talk a little bit about the thought was placed into giving people people have this opportunity to teach here mm -hmm. that didn't make you a traditional way in terms of academia. And what do we need to do in the future to carry on that legacy as far as faculty, the academic graduate students also, that legacy of black studies in Africa? Well, um, that's a big question and our time is reduced. But yes, that has always been a value of the Africana Center. When there was the coup in Grenada, we brought former Ambassador Desima Williams here. When Walter Rodney was in transition between Tanzania and uh, Guyana, we brought him here. Um, we brought people like poet My. Uh, um, Mari Evans here, yeah. the Harlem Renaissance writer, later young Julian Mayfield. Um, then in his critical years, James Foreman from SNCC brought him in, gave him base so he could work and did his graduate work. Hoyt Fuller, the grand gentleman and scholar, when um, he was in between Johnson publication and to his next when Johnson closed down Black World because of his budding relationship with Nixon and others. Um, we were more than honored to have Hoyt Fuller come and we tried to set these as models uh, for other departments of programs, but also to our students, that there is knowledge worth our having that comes from various sources. I think one of the things that we don't appreciate enough that during the 20th century that 
All of our development and gains as a people were based on our having principal activism. Abolitionism is activism. Anti-segregation campaigning is activism. Anti-racist education is activism. Activism is not somehow a bad or a dirty word, you know. It is when you decide what is morally important to you in the world and then where you stand with it. So that um, we, um, and these were models that we developed as was mentioned earlier, we saw. C.L.R. James I first met in Chicago at Northwestern that John Bracy and them brought. I hadn't known of that much of C.L.R. James, but these were classmates and others who were, were more advanced. Um, and so we understood that, that in our community there are many scholars without portfolio. And there have been activist intellectuals who have carried us from, in, from apartheid to this position we are now. All of these young people in the mid-60s that we like to say we honor and pray were active as intellectuals, many of them who gave up their university position. Julian Bond, for example, coming from the honored Bond family. Uh, Joyce Ladner, for a while, she eventually goes back. Angela Davis, who then has a good... <laughs> Stokely Kwame Torre, uh, Haki, uh, uh, Rap Brown. These people make a principal commitment to the cause of human rights and freedom for their people at the expense of what it had been their own career projectile. So we've tried to talk about critical education with social value, academic excellence in the context of social responsibility. Because we all didn't get here on our own. You know, we stand here on the strength of those who went before us. You take a woman like Fannie Lou Hamer, who gave it all, and Rosa Parks, so that one day we could be here not because they ever expected that they would be here, but they felt if we were here, they were here. Because they would say, our people are there. And they expected that we would carry on this tradition and, and legacy. Yeah, I think Professor... Oh, and then Sister Sarah, Professor uh, and Professor... Uh, my con you want well um you handle it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can we uh, get the idea to combine the questions? Yes. Uh, I'll let him right. And then we'll let him uh, let Dr. Kimmel respond, give some con conclusion to this. Unfortunately we are uh, about out of time. No, we this actually I think that's another one to us by touching like books. But the question is one at the inception of the ideas. Keep the mic on. Okay. <laughs> at the inception of the ideas of black like studies, what was supposed to be the role of literature and language? But by language, I was just finding in African American language. Mm. And and because as we go on, I mean, I have to give you a background that I come from Michigan State, where mm -hmm. university learning is problem on African American language became the center of um, mm -hmm. African studies. So, what was what was what were the ideas about language and literature? Well, and we were I'm sorry. Sorry. to combine. Go ahead. And professor, another question you wanted to combine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Professor Turner. Yes, sir. Congratulations on your great service here in Cornell and for black people throughout the world. Thank you. And in that connection, we know 
that all of Homo sapiens come from Africa, mm -hmm. starting 200,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and we didn't leave Africa until 100,000 years ago, at best 100,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we started migrating around the world 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So why isn't our true frame of reference, mm -hmm. the frame of reference as we, the parent people of humanity, or a set of people of humanity, or the original people of humanity, as not what we're saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is our view, that life began in Africa, that Africa is the source bed for some of the earliest developments of Homo sapiens, and also the world's richest um, ancient uh, cultures as well. So there's no problem we have with that. In fact, I was holding something for you. Uh, I don't know if you saw this recent report, that new archaeological findings have indicated that Africans may have stopped moving the, around the world more recently than had been thought within the last 60 to 70,000 years. So I'm holding that to share with you. Um, yes, I think the question of language and, and literature and culture has always been seen for us as being integrated in an Africana curriculum. So I'm proud to say that we started out as one of the earliest people offering African language and have been a leader, particularly in the development of Kiswahili education in the country, which Mwalimu uh, Abdul Nanji has uh, been most uh, eminent in the last three decades almost. But even before then, from our beginning, we had, that was part of why we had so much opposition within the faculty, because we were taking a uh, course, the way we developed our course, to have an integrated, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary um, focus. And so we've always considered that. Um, just like we had the, the theater and, and, and art. And our heydays, and we used to have major cultural performance at least once or twice a year presented for the benefit of the student population and the campus at large. On Ebonics, visit that. On Ebonics. Yeah, well, I think this question about uh, language, uh, I've always held to the fact that black people speak their own forms of language or dialect, if you will, but the use of language uh, well, that's an, it, it's clear that Africans use and have developed their forms of English in the U.S. as they have in the Caribbean and other parts of Africa as well. Um, we had discussions about that and in fact had course that Dalton Jones, who was with us earlier on, that did around the issue of language development in the African American community especially. And I should say also we had a strong emphasis that departments like ours, or and ours is more than the part center of Africana studies, should have a community locus. And in our plan, we had for the development of an urban center, an urban space. It was picked up and done partially at Poughkeepsie, at Vassar College. It was done at University of Pittsburgh and also at The Ohio State. They have probably the most impressive research unit in, the, in our discipline at The Ohio State University. Uh, that's still uh, functioning now. But we uh, did take 
the position. And so our early courses, for example, in African American or black psychology, part of them were held and were taught at the Southside Center, where we had an early childhood development program that was run from the Africana Center, but held in those spaces, and also provided for some early child, uh, what do you call child care services. So we were dealing with that and educational achievement as well. So uh, unfortunately, we've come to the, to the end of the event. Um, just I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for organizing. And I just wanted to say very quickly that I think that um, in giving uh, so graciously of your time, Dr. Turner, you've not only given us a great historical overview, but continue to give us a nice blueprint yeah. from which we can continue to build. So thank you very much. Well, right. Let me say thank you again to everyone as well. I, if I was slower than I usually am today, I was not feeling very well coming in here. I don't know how to reaction to a medication. I literally willed myself in this seat. And, uh, so, but thanks anyway. Yeah, I want to recognize the fact that we had a small committee with Thomas Lascosa and Professor Bob Harris, who uh, we worked together to put together the series on of the donkey, so that we're working with now. Um, I was told on Jared Ball when Ron Walter said he's one of the sharpest minds in this next generation of young scholars, and I'm so proud of you, Jared, and I'm so right. pleased that you took your time. When I told, when I asked him, he said, without a doubt, I would be there, and he showed up and he's here. We have to please acknowledge Ron. And, I mean, from Ron Walters. Hey, right. I mean, what else? <laughs> <laughs> and then he is no longer with us. Right. That's fixed, you know, yeah. so you have to live up to that and take it even further. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Um, and uh, clearly, this, this unit has produced some stellar graduates from professors across the university, uh, across the, the country, sorry, and around the world. Um, I run into them many places, Brazil, Caribbean, wherever you go, you run into people who have passed through Portland's Africana Center. So we want to really acknowledge that work of producing subsequent generations of scholars that Dr. Turner has been involved in from the start. But what I want to say in closing, you are the presence of a living legend. This is a living legend. This is a living legend. so honored that we are able to be in your presence and that you've done the kind of work that allow us to be in this space today. And I think hats off, we want to just recognize and thank you for all of that. And I, I mean, I'm always telling my students that the generation of scholars that preceded us, they did work. <laughs> I was saying today, I mean, people went around the world, paddle and, and others, without even having the language, they went by boat in the um, Ashwood Gabi, back and forth to Africa, the Caribbean, do worse without a laptop according to Houston, <laughs> the, the, the Chicago, the Philadelphia um, study. So we really have a, a generation of scholars to emulate who have really done the work and we've seen again one of them and we are really wanting to document this and this is one of the reasons why we had a conversation of two different generations mm -hmm. and thought that with your skill as an interviewer as well from your work on radio, that this would really be an important document for Africana studies. We thank you and we have a wonderful meal outside for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. 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 Thank you, Dr.